Today we have a pretty special engine, and I suppose I think it's special, but not everyone will. This is a BMW S55 V30. It's out of an F80 M3. I think it's probably from a 16 or a 17 M3. This engine's also available in the M4 and the M2. This is an engine that you just don't come across that often, especially not in this industry. It's a very expensive used engine. These are very hard to find, very hard to get cores on, and I, I guess I was just at the right place at the right time. And I have this very questionable core to take apart. Now, when I say questionable, there's a lot of clues all over this engine as to what happened to it, but it also seems like it has a pretty jaded past. The S in BMW engine nomenclature means it's from an M car or a performance oriented vehicle. Whether it's an M2, an M3, M4, M5, or M6, or any of the XMs, those cars all have an S designated engine. The S engines are typically a higher output version of the M or N engines, and that doesn't stand for motor or normal or any of those things, but it is usually a reworked version of the non-M engine. In this case, the S55 is the exact same thing as an N55. It's the same exact engine. There are no changes at all. I'm kidding. Calm down. It's not the same. I know it's not the same. The S55 has a lot of differences between an N55. My personal favorite, belt-driven water pump. Love to see that. No more electric pump. These cars also have two turbochargers on them, which in this case, they're not here. I don't always get turbos on my cores. They also have two fuel pumps versus the N55 single pump. They have a completely different rotating assembly. There's a lot of differences, but you'll see this architecture is basically similar to an N55. Now these engines have different power outputs depending on their application, but they can make as much as 490, 500 horsepower. The thing is, is that all of the people that buy all the M cars, they never modify their cars. They never make more power. They never put tunes or downpipes or anything because that would be wrong. Okay, a lot of those cars are modified. It's actually kind of difficult to find a stock one after they get to be about 15 or 20 years old, which is why a lot of these engines that come back as cores are pretty bad. They're usually pretty bad. In this case, uh, there's a few clues on this engine and, oh well, I'll just show you what I'm talking about. The first thing I noticed when I saw this engine is the fact that it's been spray painted silver. And this is kind of one of my pet peeves because it doesn't look good. It just, it just doesn't. It also has a sticker from a remanufacturer. I'm not going to zoom in and show names or anything because we don't know if they did anything wrong or if it was uh, install error. And that gets me to my next point, which clearly had a coolant leak and it's it's pretty clear where that came from right there so now we're going to work our way around the engine and i feel like this is a a bmw valve cover thing i know their valve covers are kind of expensive but that is not a repair just so you guys know now the biggest clue i think as if there aren't enough is that it has a heat tab so that tells me this engine could have been rebuilt. And if you look really close, the center is melted out. Now these heat tabs are used by salvage yards, engine rebuilders, install shops, and they're essentially stuck to an engine in a place that is near coolant. And if an engine is overheated, it melts the center out. And now normally there'll be a, a more visible gray tab in the center. In this case, it's, it's not there, which means this engine could have overheated. It's a possibility. The first thing we're going to do is see if this engine turns over. I'm sure it's fine. I mean, it still has plugs in it. Ooh, that sounded good. Sounds pretty good, actually. It's got good compression. I don't feel anything loose, which is great. Awesome. The next thing we're going to do is pull the plugs. That wasn't tight. I don't think any of these are tight. This is kind of surprising. All of the plugs look like they have some miles on them. They're not brand new looking, even though the engine is pretty clean. But I don't see any bent straps. I don't see any damaged electrodes. 
They all look pretty consistent, which is a good sign, and they are the right plug. The next thing I'd like to do is remove the fuel rail, which has integral fuel lines, which have been manhandled by some barbarian for some unknown reason. Usually they're harder to remove than that. Next, let's remove the inlet manifold. So these engines are direct injected and they typically do not look this good. This looks fantastic. I don't think this has very many miles on it since it was, whether it was rebuilt or resealed. This looks great. I don't really see any issues at all. Next, we're gonna remove the valve cover. Most of these are already loose. Actually, I need to remove this. Make it a little easier, maybe. There we go. Much like the N55, the S55 has Valvetronic, which is BMW's response to a problem that never existed in the first place, but it is a pretty novel idea. It uses this motor right there to turn this eccentric shaft, which with this pair of rockers and the camshaft determines how much air goes into the engine. Essentially, it doesn't really need a throttle body because it controls the amount of camshaft engagement. And this all looks pretty good, but I can see there's a little bit of damage to the camshaft. And that's a little worrisome. It doesn't look terrible and it may polish out, but for such a clean engine, I don't see any other reasons for that. I don't think I'm going to take the Valvetronic system apart, but we will pull this apart so that we can check what the cam journals look like, at least on the exhaust cam. And it does not look like a brand new chain guide, although it does look like it's in good shape. The next thing we're going to do is remove the injectors. Now we can use tool to remove the injectors, which apparently aren't in there very well. Oh man, that's never happened. I wish they were all that, e well actually no, because then they'd pop right out. I look these injectors over pretty well and I don't see any damage or date codes. They all appear to be in pretty good shape. Hopefully I can sell these. Next, I'm gonna remove these buckets. The next thing I'm going to do is remove the crank pulley. Well, that was easy and oh, wow, coolant leak. Any veteran BMW owner will tell you that for it to look this bad, this BMW smelled like hot coolant on a regular basis. This is a pretty normal BMW smell, but that is an excessive amount of buildup from dried coolant. Next, we'll remove the vano solenoids. Blue, you don't have to have a blue to get these out. Sometimes they just come right out. One and two. Normally, if there were metal shavings in the oiling system, we would find it on the Vanos or variable valve timing solenoids. But these look pretty clean. Next, we have three plugs to remove so we have access to the timing cassette. We didn't need that. Next, we'll remove these two cam sensors. Now, the timing chain tensioner. And unfortunately, no date codes. Next, we're gonna crack loose the cam gears. And behind the two plugs, or actually three plugs, there's a bolt 
that bolts the uh, timing cassette into the block. That one was tight, very tight. And finally, these two bolts. Now, this all should come apart. Should. One cam gear. Two cam gears. And then the timing cassette. I'm gonna pull this apart without breaking it. That's the last thing I wanna do. Look at that. See if I can find some date dates on this one. Well, it is 2015. That checks out. These would be numbers matching timing guys to your 2015 F80 M3, probably want to hang on to these. All right, next I'm going to remove the lines for the fuel pumps and the feed for the rail. Next, we'll cram these loose. Okay, let's see what this looks like. Well, it actually looks pretty good. There's a few lines, like some debris went between the roller and the cam lobe, and that's unfortunate. But I think they'll polish out. I would bet that these would sell pretty well. This is probably one of those S55 specific parts, and anything that's going to be specific for this engine is going to have value. And it's not really torn up either. Journals look pretty good. Everything, there's a little bit of damage there. It's not bad. We've definitely seen worse. Before we get to the big head bolts, we have some around the perimeter. The next thing that needs to happen is I need to prep the Valvetronic system so I have access to all of the head bolts. Because as you can see, this head bolt is blocked, this head bolt is blocked, and this head bolt is blocked. So what I'm going to have to do is remove this little bitty oiling line so that I can have access to what turns this Valvetronic motor, which will turn this eccentric shaft, which then I can remove the stop Move this far enough out of the way so that this is pointed in uh, 90 degrees from where it currently is. And then I will have access to all the head bolts. First things first. So let me put this in here. This is a four millimeter Allen, by the way. And we have to go this way. And I need to go this way now. All right, I'm gonna show you how this works before I take it apart. So as you turn this, you can see it changes the amount of engagement of the camshaft. So that's full lock it that direction, and then right, full lock the other direction. So what we need to be is right in the center. 
so that we have access to all the head bolts. So now we can get straight on that bolt. I need to remove that stop right there. And the gear is out of the way of that one. Nope, that one. The rest of these, pretty straight shot. First, we'll remove this Valtronic stop very carefully. And drop it in a place that I can't reach. That's what magnets are for. All right, now it's time to get the big head bolts out. And one major difference, I guess it's not really that major, the S55 has uniform head bolt size, whereas the N55s and the N20s have smaller head bolts on the corners or T55s, and the more center head bolts are T60s. This is only T60s, which is good and bad. It's good because I don't have to switch tools so often. It's bad because it's a much tighter fit in certain areas. So we're going to get started and work our way in. Nope, we don't want to do that. What if we... Yeah, that's not going to get in the way. Some of these head bolts don't want to come out. Next, I'm going to thread the stop for the Valtronic system back in so that in the event something goes awry, it doesn't overextend. And I should be able to. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now it is time to pull the cylinder head. Let's see here. It's a mighty thick head gasket. That's one of the thickest I've ever seen. Nope, don't don't go there. It does look like it is S55 specific because it says so. It's perfect. Well, right off the bat, we got problems. You know, anytime you can see the outline of a valve on a piston in every single cylinder, it's not good. That's generally a, a situation that you would like to avoid in your engine. Now, I didn't see any signs that the timing system was damaged at all. I mean, I could put that timing guide back into this engine and it would be perfect, but in reality, there's a few different scenarios that wind up with piston to valve contact. And one of them involves excess RPM. But you know, this is from an M car. No one would ever ring this thing out, getting on the highway or doing a long pull. No one would ever do that. Let's go take a look at that cylinder head. Every single exhaust valve, you can see the, the little marks right there. That's from the edge of the piston, the valve relief of the piston. Intake valves look good. Every exhaust valve has witness marks from contact. Now that doesn't mean that the valves are bent. That just means that there's a very, very high probability that the valves are bent. It just doesn't mean they are bent. The good news here is that if that's the worst that's wrong with this engine, this will be one of my most lucrative core purchases this year. Let's take a little peep at the cylinder walls. They look pretty decent. I don't see a ton of wear. If I get a good block out of this and a good crank out of this, oh, I better not say that. We still have to do our test, however. Hey, perfect score. 
I also think it's worth mentioning that this is a closed deck block, which you don't see that often anymore. And I think that is S55 specific. I don't think the N55 is a closed deck. So that is one major advantage for strength of this engine. Next, we're gonna rotate this thing over. We'll pull the motor mount arms off and then we'll uh, get the oil pan off. I'm sure it's not gonna leak a single thing. There goes the chain. Well, it really wasn't, really hardly had any fluid in it. This is the most drained engine I think we've ever had. Next, it's time to pull the oil pan. This has aluminum oil pan bolts. Hopefully none of them break. Should be all of them. Sure is. And there's the oil. That's not supposed to be there. What is that? Well, there's good and bad in here. The good, I don't see any metal. The bad, what is this? What is this junk? Some sort of debris. It's not really metallic. Why did I, this is never gonna come off. Some more S55 specific design. This is an oil pump. This is an oil pump. But what this does is this is a, a scavenge pump, a suction pump that pulls the oil from the turbos. And this is the regular oil pump for the engine for oil pressure. So we're gonna remove this one first and then we'll remove this one. Next, the oil pickup. These are all aluminum bolts, and I think these are all one-time use. Made a good look inside the pickup. I didn't see anything. Just a screen. Next, I need to remove the bolt that holds the oil pump gear for the oil pump. Except for the engine turns over. So, let's get the impact. And we unbolt this. And now the oil pump. One oil pump. Now we can take a good look at the inside of the crankcase. And this looks beautiful. It's clean, has very nice machine work. This is uh, pretty neat to see. Although, I did see something I don't like to see. A broken bolt between the bed plate and the block. Yes, they are aluminum. But now we need to remove the oil pan gasket because it blocks some of the bolts. It's a nice gasket. We're gonna get this belt tensioner out of the way first. Now we'll start with these bed plate bolts. We're gonna get the surrounding bolts out first and then we'll get the main cap bolts. Now we're gonna see how tight the main cap bolts are. So that is why I check how tight they are with a breaker bar, because you can tell that these two bolts, and I think it was these two bolts, didn't seem to be as tight as the rest of them. That's cause for concern. Okay, now I think we can get this bed plate out.
All right, there's our first look at the journals. And I like what I see. Well, guys, I almost goofed. I need to remove this tensioner so that I can remove this seal so that I can uh, free the chain cassette and I'll remove the vacuum pump and which is essentially where the high pump, high pressure fuel pumps bolt to and get all that out of the way. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to get the crank out. Now this cover is typically one time use. So what I usually do is take a hammer and a chisel and I hammer a little slit into it like this. which isn't working at all. I think I can get to that from the backside actually. Let's see if I can pop that out now that the uh, bottom of the block is off. Why didn't I think of that? Yeah, this is much, much more better here. Like a glove. Next, we're gonna turn this over just enough so that I can get on all the uh, all of the bolts that hold the uh, vacuum pump, like that. And finally, we can get these two. There we are. Now, we'll crack the rod caps loose. We are going to take this one out a little bit more civilized. There we are. The old slide hammer trick. That's better. Those bolts don't come out. Okay. All right, now, and, and only now, the crank should come out. Now it's time to push the rods and pistons out. Let's see if we can do that without any tools here. There's one. Two. The rod bearings definitely have some wear, but this really isn't that terrible. It's pretty common for S engines. With a few exceptions, most S engines, rod bearings are maintenance items. And I know a lot of people just recoil when I say that, but that's just the way it is. I, I wish it wasn't, if that makes you feel any better. Now, I did look these bearings over, and they have a BMW stamp on them they are original bmw equipment and i ran the part number on a couple of them and they come back to original size factory bearings the rods and pistons look really nice with the exception of the brand new valve reliefs and i honestly don't think that's going to cause much of an issue i don't think that's a big deal there's hardly any skirt wear coating's in good shape find any damage nothing's melted the rods are practically perfect and these may clean up to where you don't even see that the valves kiss them they certainly aren't that deep if there is any damage don't see any broken ring lands it's really hard to tell if the vehicle was modified or what was going on once I get the core because it's been through so many hands at that point. And this crankshaft is just, it's fantastic. It just looks so good. There's a few scratches on a couple journals that I think will polish out. Nothing grooved, nothing I can catch my fingernail on. It's pretty nice machine work on this thing. It's a very expensive piece. Main bearings, 
Similar story, I would say more severe wear, which is kind of surprising. That's probably the worst one right there. But they're not torn up. Where they do, uh, I think it probably still made good oil pressure, but how long would it last? Eh, it's really hard to say. And again, I looked these up. I ran the numbers on them. These are factory bearings. Let's take a look at this machine work. It's pretty nice. I, I know I, I geek out over this stuff. We pull, we pull down a lot of motors on this channel, a lot of engines, and they rarely look this nice. Usually there's a, a hole in it, bearing delete. None of that on this one. The one thing I am curious on though is this broken off bolt. This held the bed plate to the block and these are one time use bolts. So I'm not mad it's broke except for I'm mad that it's there. And let's see, eee. no, no way. Oh yeah. Let's get a good look at these bores. They look nice. Really nice. Virtually no vertical wear or scratches. They have that same weird pattern that that N20 had. But I don't think that's from any problem. I did say, or did read a uh, comment that said that pretty much all these engines look like that after they've been run. Maybe that's not a problem, that little X. Yeah, this looks good. A little mark there, it's not bad. This is a good block. When I first saw this engine, I figured it would be the classic BMW overheat. We saw a clear coolant leak on the front of the engine, it had been leaking for quite some time, lots of green fuzzies, and the center of the heat tabs were melted out. Those heat tabs are something that rebuilders, salvage yard shops, they put on engines to tell if an engine has been above normal operating temperature, meaning it was overheated. This little center melts out when that happens. They don't just accidentally melt out at a lower temperature. They only melt when they get too hot. And in this case, this engine was too hot at least one time. But that doesn't always mean that there's damage associated with an overheat. I didn't see any signs of that inside this engine. There were no cracks in the cylinder head. The plugs all look the same. There's no signs of coolant in the combustion chamber. All of that stuff looked good. The head gasket looked good. But what I did find is that the pistons hit the valves. And that doesn't just accidentally happen. That can happen a few different ways. We've seen that before on the channel. But in this case, because the damage was uniform across all six pistons, I don't think it was out of time. Typically, an out of time engine, you'll have pistons with worse damage and pistons with damage that aren't so bad. In this case, when you over rev an engine, the valves can't keep up with the camshafts. The valve springs can't keep the valves seated when they need to be seated, and the valves are partially open when the piston comes up. But there's no force of the rocker or the cam behind it, which means that the damage usually isn't too severe. It will bend valves, and that could have happened here, but it won't cause major piston damage unless it's really, really bad. This teardown made me really happy and kind of sick to my stomach. The happy part is that I have a ton of really good parts to sell. I didn't expect to get as nearly as many parts as I have out of this and everything seems to be in very good shape with very few exceptions. The part that makes me sick to my stomach, why was this engine silver? The only reason that you would paint an engine is to let someone know or give the illusion, imply that the engine has been rebuilt. If you rebuild one of these engines, why on earth would you reinstall the timing guides, the brittle plastic parts that have killed BMW engines for years and years? Why would you reinstall that unless, just maybe, you didn't rebuild it? You just wanted it to appear that way. And I think that's, I hope that's not what happened here, but that sure feels like what happened here. The bearings, they were all original. I didn't see any signs that had been replaced. They were standard size. The pistons were original pistons, standard size. There's no machine work done that I could tell. 
And uh, aside from a few small clues, one broken bolt on the bed plate, and maybe not quite as tight a bolt on one of the main cap, everything else appeared to be untouched. Maybe the head was off. I, I don't know. But it still doesn't warrant the fact that this engine was painted silver, giving the illusion that it had been fully rebuilt, unless they just reused parts like those, pl those rubber plugs, which can leak. You shouldn't reuse that stuff. So that part makes me not so happy. Plus, this is a very expensive engine. I, probably one of the most expensive engines I've ever torn down on this channel. So if you'd like to buy any of the parts out of it, they're not cheap, I'm sorry. Or you want to buy any parts out of yet another Land Cruiser. This is, uh, it only has 300,000 miles on it. So it's almost broken. I'm going to leave our email in the video description. You can also go to importapart.com and peruse our inventory. I've been uploading our cars just about every single week. I really hope you enjoyed this teardown as always. I love all the comments, all the feedback, and even the criticism. I love it all, and I'll catch you on the next one.